Oh, it sneaked under there when I wasn't paying attention. All right, everybody. Welcome to what is week six for R for Data Science. And we got quite a bit to go through this week. We've got three chapters. Basically, two of them were little dinky ones, and then I put on one that is actually substantive. And so we've got three to go through as a result. So the first one we have is called Projects Workflow. And it basically discusses the, um, the projects workflow within our studio. Um, one of the big benefits of using it is, you know, increasing your reproducibility of everything that you do. And to that effect, one of the first things that they suggest that you, the authors suggest that you do is go into your RStudio preferences and turn off anything that keeps the dot R data for your workspace. So you can see there are two arrows here that show you where, what you would need to change from the default settings. And this is to make sure that, again, it's with reproducibility. So if you, for some reason, take your work to another laptop, then you can just open up that um, project folder and it's right there. You don't have to have something that was maybe you didn't realize that you had loaded it into your our studio workspace and that you don't have it on this other laptop, which I've run into a few times before I've went ahead and shut out these settings myself. The other reasons that it's good to use the um, project setup inside of our studio is that everything is contained in one directory. So imagine if you ever need to go back and somebody asks you, hey, can you tweak this or that, or maybe you do this, you do something randomly one quarter and you've kept a project of it. And they're like, hey, could you do that for the next quarter? Well, you have all your scripts there. You have the data set from last time that you can at least look at and be like, okay, well, this is what I did. And you also, if you want to compare, you know, like previous outputs, like your charts, you have them right there if you've saved them inside of that project. And beyond that, it also is a way to just keep all of your projects clean and separate from each other. I know that I'm not very good at using the R Studio project setup at my work right now, and I need to get better because I have about eight different projects that are all sitting in one folder, and one day that's going to burn me, and I know it. I just need to find the time to set up everything and turn it into separate R project, R project setups. So, Luke, I have a general question here. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever used the workflow uh, package? I have not. So I guess I've always been really curious. So like there's Drake and there's workflow and I did attend a talk on workflow, which is like basically project management, but it's also setting up like the paths and the relative paths and everything so that you don't have to change it. And I really want to know how the RStudio project plays into the workflow like setup. And I was, meaning to ask the author that and I just, you know, like it's just one of those things you never do till you really get burned and you lose okay. something or you overwrite something. So I know it's going to happen one of these days. It's inevitable, inevitable, but I just didn't know if you'd already implemented that and if you could add any input into this, but that's, that's cool. It's, it's just something yeah. to think about like a workflow flow, uh, like, uh, and how you can integrate project into that workflow. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have experience on that. Um, I think I went to that talk too. Um, oh, is this the one with Blishak? I think it's Blishak or whatever his last name. I John. don't remember. I was, it, it was in, I, I think it was the New York meetup, right? The Jared Lander. Oh, that's the Drake one. Okay, so that's Miles McBain. That's probably the one that you went to. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Uh, yeah. So Drake is in, that's right. So Drake is another option, but then there's another new kid on the block called Workflow, and it's like it's not as involved as uh, as Drake, and so it's like really easy to set up. And I even did it like initially, and then I fell out of the habit. So, yeah, I feel really like terrible, you know, because I <laughs> go to these talks and I never implement them. So, anyway, that's all right. Um, I've done. I've been. I've sat in on a few about like unit testing and stuff. I'm like, I've not used this yet because I'm a bad computer person, but it's yeah, okay. I just, uh, no, I mean, they just, they just updated all the unit testing. Like, I think there was a talk on it a couple of weeks ago and I've never done any of that, but I don't, I don't have to, you know, like test people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't, 
I don't share a whole bunch of code with other people right now. And, and I tend to, what I tend to do is write lots of comments. Yeah. That's kind of my way around it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's good practice. Definitely. It, it's more so I remember how I did things as opposed to other people being able to reproduce it. Cause I can't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I really love the whole workflow process, you know, I, but I just don't have my act together. I'm so chaotic and so like spur of the moment. Like I really, I just really absolutely hate that about myself. Like I need so to, what, make do you mean? what do you mean? Like, I mean, one of the things that I've started doing is I'll like have an, you know, like uploading data file and then I'll have a cleaning file and then I'll have like an analysis file. What kind of things are you talking about? Like, well, you know, sometimes, well, you know how it is, right? Like sometimes I, I will set the path, like I will yeah. set an absolute path there, not a relative path. Sometimes I will uh, send code off to someone else and then there's something there that's not present on their computer. So in other words, I can't just package it all up and send it in a way that will be reproducible on someone. So like, I'm, I guess I'm referring to reproducibility in terms of um, oh, I see like, what you mean. not just collaborating with your team, but also if you're doing just like one-off projects and you want the other person to. So I just need to get into like a routine of using a workflow uh, process. And I don't have that. I really hope this book gets into that. And then we can maybe tie in the latest and greatest um, packages that have come out and like, you know, do a really good session on that. I, I really need to switch my work habits. <laughs> So, I mean, if there's not a session on it, we could always, if somebody feels, you know, confident presenting on, on it at some yeah. point, we could always just have like a random addendum for some reason. That's a really good idea. I, I, I'm really down for that. And I'm more than happy to do the session on workflow because I really imbibed it. I just am not practicing it. That's the problem. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I think if, it, if there's some kind of like killer tool, we can just like, or some kind of package that you're just like passionate about and you think that other people here can benefit from it, even if it's not part of the book. There's no issue with like having an extra session where we kind of look into stuff like that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, sounds good. I'll, I'll uh, put that on the Slack and then maybe we can take a poll or whatever and see what everyone thinks. Okay. Um, I think I'll jump back in here now. Um, so the other nice thing about using the project setup is that when you go inside of the directory that you've created for whatever project, there is a .rproj um, file type that's or little file that's within it. And if you double click that, it will open our studio. It will open you within that project and it will have all of your um, directories and everything set like they need to be. So maybe you quit running into the um, absolute directory problem which I am also super guilty of. And actually when I was going remote all the time back in April and May, there were a lot of times when like I had switched over to this MacBook and there were things that were like set up as like a Windows file and like the file space for everything was Windows. I'm like, oh crap, I have to like rewrite every single thing. So this would have kept me from being burned on that as well. Yeah, I find that projects are really important it's just like can get so messy. Do you just like have one folder that you have them all in? No, I, um, well, I have like a documents folder and every time I do something new, I just start a new project in a new, um, R session. Okay. And then, um, yeah. Yeah. It's probably one of those. It's a matter of 30 seconds of like going up in the top right and hitting new R project and yeah. I don't do it. <laughs> so true, so true. <laughs> well, I'll say one thing though, after I figured uh, Sharingan and Sharingan Extra and all of those things out, the one thing I have been really, really religiously and diligently true to is creating an R markdown and knitting it to the moon reader and like just having everything like in that form, you know? So like uh, that, that is probably the only my only like reproducibility right now. Uh, but I, I am very diligent about uh, markdowns. So like, I don't just randomly do scripts like I used to in the past. So uh, only thing I'm proud of, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I think today was actually my first time toying with Zeringan. And I just kind of character, um, copied Eric's from like week three and just went straight with it. And I was like, okay, well, this actually worked out pretty good. Hmm. 
All right, so the other tiny chapter that we have is the start of our wrangling session or section. And if you look here in the highlighted part of the image, the import, tidy, and transform um, steps are all part of the wrangle process. And this is basically where we're going to take our data and get it ready for modeling and visualizing and then retransforming it and visualizing it and modeling it and then spitting it out for communication. So if you want to be able to go through all that, um, these are the very first steps that you go through. So some of the things we deal with in the coming chapters include, you know, just importing the data. So, I mean, do you bring it in as a CSV? Do you bring it in through Excel or whatever program that you, or whatever style that you have your data in? I actually just learned read Excel like last week. I've just been turning everything into CSV within Microsoft Office before that. So it saved a bit of time. Um, and then there's basically we're learn, we'll also learn in this section how to tidy things up and format it in a way that the tidyverse is able to use the data that we are sharing into R. And then we get into transforming the data, which is also kind of a bit of what we were doing with manipulating with dplyr and such, but it's also gets into different formats for the data for individual um, variables and things like that. So if you need a date time or you need a string or a factor or something like that. Um, that was just kind of a lead into our first um, actual chapter of the section, which is on tibbles. And tibbles are basically kind of a data frame that's been a little bit beefed up since um, R is decades old at this point. Basically, Hadley went back and was like, okay, well, here's some issues that I have with data frames and some things that I think could improve them and created a package for it. So the way that Tibble set up are that they are data frames, but they tweak some older behaviors that you see in the um, base R data frames to make life a little bit easier. And this just gets back to the way that Tidyverse is a much more accessible entry point for R. I know that's been my case personally. And you will hear about tibbles a lot throughout this book because they are one of the unifying features in the tidyverse. So if you want to be able to use tibbles, um, it's pretty easy. Chances are if you've already, chances are you've already got R Studio up and you've probably already called your library for tidyverse. And if you've done that, you've got tibble ready. But if you ever need to call it individually, it has its own package that you can call with just library tibble. And one of the things that you're probably going to end up doing a lot is taking the kind of taking your base R style of data frames and turning them into tibbles. So there's actually a function for that called as underscore tibble. And you can see here what that it was done with the iris data set. Some things that you see here that you won't that you wouldn't see with a typical data dot frame is first it tells you that it's a tibble and gives you the dimensions right there. Um, and then below the, below the column names, you're actually seeing what type of data it is. So we have a double, a double, a double, a double, and factor. And it's only printing out 10 rows here and telling you that there's 140 more, as opposed to you'll usually get, is it 1,000? And then it cuts off if you use default. I think that sounds right. But basically, it can be a giant mess if, you're, if you just hit print on a typical data frame. Whereas if you just type in, if you were as Tibble Iris, you get this. Or, and you could also just for some reason, if you wanted to overwrite Iris, you could say Iris and assign it to as Tibble Iris. On top of vectorizing, or on top of turning data frames into Tibbles, you can also do so with a vector and you can see that it was done here on three different columns in three different ways. So what you're seeing is that in the first column, it goes one, two, three, four, five for that X column, because that's what it's been ordered to do. And then because it doesn't have five entries for Y, it is kind of cycling through. And so that's why we're getting one every time in the Y column. For example, if you had one, two, or if you had one to two here, it'd go one, two, one, two, one and we just keep cycling that way. 
And then for the Z column, we have X squared plus Y. So that's why we start getting crazy higher numbers. Does everything there make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking how crazy high 26 is. Yeah. <laughs> Like, whoa, 26, that is crazy high. No, sorry. Yeah, it took me a second. I was like, how did they get, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> did I oh, hit the net? Do, 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 uh, there, okay. Apparently it's arrows not clicking. All right, so tibbles are, like I said, they're different from data frames and sometimes that's for a reason. So some of the things that you won't see tibbles do is change your data input type. So. If you're dealing with strings coming, coming in, you're going to get strings going out. They're not gonna be switched to factors like a lot of times would happen with a data frame. Um, then there's also, tibble by itself is not going to change the name of your variables. However, there are ways to do it if you want to. Um, and the same, along the same vein, it does not change your row names, or it does not create row names, sorry. So basically, if you want to have a row ID, you're going to have to put in, you know, like a row ID column and make it one to whatever. Um, the other thing that you're able to do with tibbles that you're not able to do within base R data frames is create um, column names that don't match our syntax. So the one example we saw in the book was like, the, he made the smiley emoticon, one of his table names, or one of his column names for whatever reason, or even made the year 2005 one because you can't normally do that. And it was just a matter of surrounding the characters that he wanted in that um, variable name with back ticks. Mm -hmm. And another useful tool that's within this package is called the Tribble or trans Transpose Tibble. And this is a way to go in with column header headings already created. And they basically use the tilde in front of what you want the column heading to be. So as you see here in the code example, we have X, Y, and Z as the names. And then this commented out portion is just a matter of, he said, you know, it's something that he does for himself just so he knows where the names are, which I think is pretty smart. And then you're seeing just basically every um, observation after that. Is there anything here that's any bit confusing? Okay. Okay. So let's look at a little bit more of the differences between tibbles and data frames. Um, when printing, there's a few things that you'll notice. First of all, as we saw earlier, tibbles will only show the first 10 rows when you just type out the name of a tibble. So if you did, I don't know, tibble in a tibble version of MT cars, you would get the first 10 observations in that. And you would also get, you know, the idea of what kind of structure each of the variables that it shows is. And it's not going to show every variable necessarily. It's going to show what fits on your screen unless you tell it to show more rows or show more columns, which you can do with settings that are within it. But for kind of the default settings, it's going to basically do something that's convenient for you, unless it's not what you want. And this is where I actually had to read this part over a few times, I'll be honest, but, and I actually didn't know some of these pieces, but. When, when you're subsetting, there's a few key differences between tibbles and data frames. First off, tibbles will never do partial matching, which I guess I didn't know data frames could do, but we'll see an example later of where it's like, oh, that does partial match. That's not necessarily good. But if you try to partial match, it will fail and tell you that the column you're trying to access does not exist. You'll get a null. However, you, there are a couple ways to extract your columns within tibbles. The first is the double bracket setup. And you can use that on either names within quotes or position numbers. And there's also the dollar sign, which is what I'm more familiar with. Like it's literally been the only one I use. I didn't even know about the double brackets and that only works with the column name. 
So some of the examples we've got here, um, first we're trying to call by dollar sign and name. And you, you notice when you use dollar sign, you don't need the quotes on the column name. And so we, we were able to get the, we were able to produce what cam comes out of the X column. And we were able to do that similarly with the double bracket setup, but you had to make sure that the column name X was within quotes while also within the double brackets. And then we see that functionality of using it for position when we go here with the one inside of the double bracket. So that's giving us the y, the y output here because it would be x would technically be zero and y would be one. So we're getting the y output on this one. And another thing to note is just if you're trying to use those tools within a pipe, you need to use a special placeholder of a period before them. So here we see df pipe and then dot or period dollar sign x or period double bracket quote x. Was anybody else familiar with the double bracket thing before? I had always just learned the dollar sign. So th this was actually interesting. Yeah, because it's, it's actually a list. The tibbles are actually lists. And so that's why you have the use of double bracket. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of just, you know, pick up things as I discover them. <laughs> so here we're kind of getting into some of the examples that were in the book. So we see that we originally had a data frame where there's an ABC column and the, ans and the value is one. There's an XYZ column and the only value is A as a string. So what I did on the next line is I created a tibble out of it using as tibble. So we have a data frame version and a tibble version. So when we print them out, here's how they look different. First of all, one of them tells you it's a tibble and also tells you what kind of what type of um, data that you have. And then from there is similar. So here's where we get into some, some of the differences in how you call things. So again, we had a column that was X, Y, Z. We didn't have a column that was X, but if you try to call X within the data frame, it will still spit back out A. However, if you do it within the tibble, you get a null because it failed because it's looking for literally X, Y, Z because that's what we called it. It's like, no, there's no column just called X. Mm -hmm. And then here we're using position to try to find the X, Y, Z column for a data frame and we're getting it back. And this works similarly in the tibble. And this was the last example I believe they had and this basically you wanted to get both columns. And this is showing that this function works similarly as well. It's a, I mean, it's probably basic for most people, but like I looked at it and I had to like glance for a second to figure out what it was doing. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay, now I get it. But yeah, that is this week's three chapters. And Allison Horst is an awesome artist. I don't know yeah. if you've like seen her stuff on our stats Twitter, but it's all like this and it's fun. Uh -huh. That was great, Luke. Really good. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we're I, and I not that. I didn't know that data frames did partial matching of names. I didn't either. <laughs> I'm so excited that I learned something new. Yeah, so I mean, now there's not like, huh, there's ways that I can use that at work. Like I keep running into that when we do the stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, I can like do things efficient, kind of. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I really love, I love all the, all the things. I'm slowly starting to feel like an actual data person as we get through the chapters. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to learn map. I'm not very good at map. Oh, yeah. I don't understand how it works. I always do it wrong. I mean, I had to learn um, Luberdate the hard way, so I know I'm probably gonna take that chapter, but there's like 
as far as strings and factors, I know I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to like, you know, read this chapter three or four times because there's so much that I need to get out of this. Strings are hard. Like I've got the cheat sheet sitting on my desk at work and it's like, yeah. no, 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 still don't get it. Yeah, I have, um, I have, I have all of the cheat sheets and bound up and like a thing and I'm, I always use them all the time. There's just so much to learn. I'll never know it all. I mean, that's the beauty of the 80-20 rule, I guess, is that you never have to, because you can always just look back. Yeah. And I mean, my wife does a lot of this stuff too, and she's just like, yeah, my Google foo is, you know, what keeps me afloat. It's like, there's no shame in having to look things up. Yeah, that's for sure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording here. And yeah. I I can't believe I was able to get through three chapters in one session. That was awesome. There yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm surprised. I I'm surprised too. I thought, oh I I was, you know, let me see. I'm you know, I just I thought, oh, I have so much to learn, but I'm feeling like, you know, I don't as much. Yeah, this is, I think it was, even though I wasn't familiar with like how Tibbles work, it was an easy chapter to read, I thought. Yeah, I need to sit down and read the whole thing, but I'm, I don't want to start with like the easy stuff because then I get bored. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Pavitra, do you have anything to say or anything to add? She looks like she's muted. There we are. Okay, I think I'm I think I'm gonna go ahead and close it down. I've had a day. We've had emergency plumbers over and I'm just ready oh, to no. like, I'm ready to like not have noise in my ears for a good few hours. Oh no. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Thank you, Luke. See you yeah. next week. You too. Everybody okay, have a great so week. Yeah. Bye. 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 In meeting for all.